sowing the seed of your life. I have several texts. Normally I would be dealing with the book of Luke, but as I looked at the text this week, I saw that I already preached from this same passage a few months ago when we dealt with the healing ministry of Christ, how he heals the whole person. And I had been feeling for two weeks I wasn't supposed to preach that and I uh, wasn't supposed to stay on the text of Luke and I didn't know why and then I saw, well, I already did that. I felt prophetically to share this today. And so uh, I'm gonna read several passages that actually connect together in some way, form, or fashion. So first of all, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. Paul the Apostle said, I will most gladly spend and be spent. Some would say spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Jesus said in Mark 4, 20, that those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Jesus also said in John 12, verse 24 and 25, Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world keeps it for eternal life. And then Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is the main text, he, he said, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, as it is written, he has distributed freely, has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is overflowing in thanksgiving to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. So there was a lot there, so I'm going to be quick. When we understand how scripture is written, we have to understand, first of all, that it was written to the audience of that day. If scripture was written today, it would be written quite differently. It would have things related to smartphones and Instagram and Snapchat and metaphors that relate to the times in which we live. So that being said, uh, there was a, a, a metaphor that was used several times in scripture regarding the sea. And that was because it was an agrarian culture. That is to say that it was a, uh, a culture that understood farming, that understood cattle and sheep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So because of that, a lot of the metaphors that we use to depict truth, to depict God's ways, had to do with an agrarian mindset. And even though most of us are not farmers, maybe some of us have a few tomatoes in their backyard, that doesn't make you a farmer, by the way, doesn't make you an agricultural expert, but you might have some expertise compared to all of us city folk. Uh, but even those of us who don't have the luxury of having a farm or even plants in the backyard understand that if you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get pineapples. I mean, does anyone? We all understand that, right? Or if we plant one apple seed, we're not going to get millions of trees just from that in the next year. So we do understand some of the basics of this, uh, you know, agricultural mindset. So as we see here in the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which really to do it justice, we should have read chapter 8. Uh, 
Paul the Apostle was using the seed as an example of sowing finances. Because in chapter 8, he was using his apostolic ministry to raise money for some of the poorer brothers and churches that he was overseeing. Uh, we see how they had a collection of churches that he started. He actually planted churches in 31 of the major cities of the Roman Empire. He did it strategically. He planted in cities, not in suburbs and not in some country place. He planted in the most influential places of the world at that time. Which, by the way, if he was alive today, he would be planting a church right here in Brooklyn. He'd be planting a church in Manhattan, in Queens, in all five boroughs. Uh, and so he had an apostolic association, if you want to call it that, of every church he planted. And they all helped each other. They raised money for each other. They preached um, in each other's churches. They helped each other in the same way Christian has been helping us. He's part of that circle, that apostolic circle of our church. Uh, we have many people that have come out of our church and come back and help us and minister to us. And even uh, Pastor Steve Hannon, who was here last week, he was one, he's one of my spiritual sons, and he has a church in New Jersey, and, uh, uh, and he's preached in Staten Island. So uh, we can't do everything alone. And so we actually have a team, apostolic team, whether it's formal or informal, in which we're all working together for the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and I told some of my leaders in New Jersey that I'm going to need them to help me with preaching in Staten Island because I travel at times and I can't do everything that I'm supposed to do. So I don't have to do it. God has forced me into this model, this apostolic model, depending on other leaders and churches to do what we're supposed to do. And guess what? That is more biblical than just somebody preaching every week for years and years and years and years, and there's no collection or sharing of, of, of offerings or helping people outside of our own realm. So God forces us to, to be interdependent, not be independent. So we're not an independent church. We belong to a coalition of churches called Christ Covenant. We belong to a larger body of people that work together relationally, and I thank God for that. Isn't that great? Amen. Yes. So Paul was using the seed to depict the need for helping financially these churches that he was overseeing. However, he went a step further, as we just read in the uh, same uh, book of the Bible or epistle. He said later on in this letter, he said, I will gladly spend, but be spent as well, because I love you so much. Wow. That is awesome. I mean, it's one thing just to spend. I could take some extra change out. You know, I could put my tithes in. But I still, maybe I'm living off of 90%. I could, you know, help somebody out with five bucks here and there. I'm spending. That's one thing. But to be spent takes it to a whole nother level. And what I want to speak to you today is how your life is the seed of God. Your life is the seed of God. God wants you to go from throwing money in the offering or helping someone every now and then or carving out an hour or two for God to pray or, you know, go to church once in a while. He wants you to go beyond that where your life is the seed where you're not just spending time, spending money, giving a little bit here, giving a little bit there, but you are spent. You have sown yourself in God's field. That's where God has taken this church. That's where God has taken you. He gave me this prophetic word two weeks ago. And Jesus was speaking about the same thing when he said in John chapter 12, Verse 24, he said that a grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die. Otherwise, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. But then right after that, he said, he who loves his life will lose it. And loses his life will save it. What was he saying? He was saying that that grain of wheat was you and me. 
and he was also pointing to the fact that that greater week was first and foremost initiated by himself when he died on the cross. That greater week died, and now look at it, billions and billions and billions of seed have come as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection. You will only get out of life based on the commitment you give to life. You will only receive from God commensurate to what you give to God. If you're just a nice church goer, you drop your tithe and offering it once a week, and you do your church thing, and God is part of your life, you know, you'll have some blessing. You'll probably make it to heaven. But and just because you go to rest doesn't mean you make it to heaven. That's a whole other conversation. But I'll tell you, if you really want to maximize your life, you don't differentiate between what is yours and what is God's. Christ is your life. That's where he's taking you. God isn't just an important part of my life. That's where I perceive about 40 to 50% of you all right now, if I could be so bold. Prophetically, I'm going to say that. 40 to 50% of you, God is an important part of your life. I hope by the end of this message, you contemplate and think in such a way and process the words that you listen to this on our app constantly until it gets to the point that Christ is not an important part of your life. Christ is your life. So that you can't even tell the difference between what is yours and what is his. It's all his. We compartmentalize. Well, God, you know, you have this. And I have this. Well, God allows us to utilize some things for ourselves, which we're going to see. But even though it may be utilized for you, it's still his. So Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. He also said in Mark chapter 4 that when seed was sown on good soil, it bore much fruit. Some 30, 60, some 100 times more than what was sown. So in that context, the seed was the word of God that was preached. In Paul's context, that had to do with money that was sown. But in any context, the principle is the same. When you sow seed, it multiplies. It multiplies. When you sow your time, it multiplies. When you sow love, it multiplies. When you sow goodness, it multiplies. When you sow finances, it multiplies. Whatever you sow, you will reap. If you're not reaping a lot, it means you're not sowing a lot. People say, well, I don't have that many friends. You probably don't sow a lot of your love into people. Some people have so many friends, they don't know what to do with it. Others, I hear complain, I don't know, nobody cares. Nobody, oh, oh, nobody cares about you. You probably don't care about anybody else. That's probably why. I mean, let's call it the way it is. That's how life operates. You get what you sow. It's not always black and white like that. Sometimes you are sowing love and people will bite you right in the behind. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, the hand that feeds gets bit. Yes, I've been bit many times by people I've loved. But generally speaking, if you sow love, you're going to reap it. Maybe not from that person, but somehow... God will bring it back to you. And so, as we understand this, I want us to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and look at this text a few verses at a time. Verse 6, Paul said, The point is this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So let's just stop there for a moment. And so again, he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
And so he's showing here how God blesses us back according to how we bless others, according to what we sow, according to how we live, if you want to look at it like that. And then he says, each one of us must, must give as he has decided in his heart. So what is God saying there? God is saying, I want you to do this based on a relationship with me. God is not into religion. You all know that? What is religion? There's so much performance-based Christianity in the world today. Even worship teams, worship leaders, they're up there shaking their behind and they're, you know, singing and putting all this into their professionalism, their makeup, their stylistic stuff, the lighting, the smoke, the videos and all of this. And basically when it comes down to it, some of them really are worshiping, but some of them aren't. Some of it, it's a performance. Many people go to church, it's a performance. So what God is saying here is, I don't want you to do this out of compulsion. I don't want you to do this because someone is making you do it or because you're coerced. I mean, a lot of times, you know, as kids, we, we've gone to church because our parents made us, and that's okay. I believe in that because they're young. They don't know what to do. I mean, it was up to kids. They would just eat ice cream all day. They wouldn't have broccoli. <laughs> So some people say, well, I'm not going to make my son go to church. The boy is eight years old. You make him go to church. As long as he's under your roof, you make him go to church. The boy can be 40. You're in my house, you go to church. But the point is, when they're on their own, they do what they want. But you don't let a 12-year-old kid do what they want. So we're not talking about that. But as you grow and you're an adult, God, you know, Quite frankly, you don't need your money. You don't need you to warm up this seat. You are not doing God one blessed favor by being here today. When I first got saved, I thought every time I read the Bible, I'd get a reward. Every time I came to church, oh, 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 oh I'm earning. God is going to really bless me. God, what are you talking about? This is for you. It's not for God. And so we're not doing God any favors by showing up. God says, I love a cheerful giver because if you really knew God, you were counted in honor. Yes. Whether it's to give your finances, give your time, give your life. Those who understand the reign of God in this world will always give cheerfully. Why? Because they know that God is sovereign. God ultimately has the final say on everything. And that we could never, ever outgive God in our time and our love and our life and our money. No matter what, the generosity of God is greater than any generosity that we could ever come up with. And so once we get that, we don't just give out of coercion. We're not reluctant. We just, man, God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that doesn't mean... That, if you don't feel like it, that you don't do it at times. I don't feel like being in church right now. I'd rather be home sleeping. No, I'm only kidding. But there have been times when I really didn't want to preach. I didn't want to be here. But you know what? I come because it's a matter of stewardship. Sometimes you don't feel like getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning changing diapers. But if you didn't do it because you didn't feel like it, you'd be a terrible parent. You do it. Because it's a matter of stewardship. So there is something to be said about serving God sometimes when it goes against your feelings. Sometimes you're reading the Bible when you don't want to. Praying when you don't want to. Going to church when you don't want to. Why? Because you know that it's somehow, some way, going to do something good. And you're giving God opportunity to move on that soul of yours. And so many things I do, not just the things of God, things of family, personal things. Sometimes I'm so tired, I don't feel like brushing my teeth. I don't feel like washing my face before going to bed. I'd rather crawl into bed sometimes without any proper hygiene. And I say, ah, oh, Joe, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Brush your teeth. Come on now. Do something. I mean, I'm so exhausted, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what I have to do. And, uh, and so when we give God space when we don't feel like it, God does move. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about a religious performance-based giving. He said God doesn't want that kind of giving. 
of our life, our finances, our time. He wants and loves a cheerful giver. And then he goes on to say, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And so God is not stupid. What God is saying is, if you're a giver, I'm going to keep abounding my grace and gifts to you, so that you will have all sufficiency in all things at all times, and continue to abound in every good work. So when he sees he could trust you with money, he could trust you with friends, he could trust you with ministry, he could trust you with your time, he could trust you with certain parts of our life, of your life. Well, he's going to keep abounding to you because he wants you to bless and extend his kingdom. Does that make sense? I mean, if he knows he could trust you, he is going to continue to do what needs to be done to help you do what needs to be done. It's a very, very simple thing. Uh, I mean, if you give somebody a dollar to get you the newspaper and they spend it on Lucky Charms or, I don't know, whatever, that's probably too cheap for Lucky Charms, but they spend it on M&Ms, you're not going to give them a dollar again to go to the store, right? It would be stupid to do that. Well, God operates like that. He's smarter than us. He's not going to give you something if he can't trust you with it. So the more you sow your seed properly, the more you do what you're supposed to do with the gifts that God has given you, the talents, the abilities God has given you, the more he's going to abound so that you can continue to do good works for him. And then he says, verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower, someone say seed to the sower, seed to the sower. and bread for food, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Wow. He will supply and multiply your seed. So someone may say, you know, I don't really have hardly enough to survive. I really don't have much seed. Well, the answer to that is astonishing. I don't have much seed. If you say to yourself, I don't have much seed, I don't have much to give, now don't get mad at me. This is the word of God. I don't have much seed. I don't have much to give. Verse 10, he who supplies, he who supplies, God who supplies seed to the sower. You don't have much seed? God supplies seed to the sower. You don't have much seed? What are you not doing? You're not sowing. He who supplies seed to the sower. He doesn't supply seed to the hoarder. Jesus. He doesn't supply seed to the self-focused. He doesn't supply seed to the selfish. He doesn't supply seed to those who just save everything. I'm, it, who's preaching? Who made this stuff up? Am I preaching the word of God? Yes, you are. He who supplies seed to the? Sower. To the? Sower. To the? Sower. You don't have much seed, you're not sowing. You're not sowing. It's either God's word is true or it's not. And I believe it is. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Now, he makes a distinguishing characteristic between seed and bread. Seed is what God commands you to give to his kingdom. Whether it's money, time, uh, abilities, and bread, it's still God's, but it's what God wants you to use for you. So, if I ate a lemon seed, it would taste very bitter, wouldn't it? Some of you, and I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, because I know why God told me to preach this message. 
some of you are eating your seed. Jesus. And when you eat your seed, you're robbing yourself of a harvest. If you eat the apple seeds, you will not have a lot of apple trees. What you need to understand is to distinguish between your seed and your bread. Your tithe is not your bread, it's God's. 10% is God's. And then you pray about what to do, anything above that, it's still not yours, it's God's. What you want me, God, what do you want me to give financially? And then there's other amounts that God says it's bread. Now, if I sow bread in the ground, the only thing that's going to happen is the bugs is going to, are going to eat it. And so I don't want to eat my seed and sow my bread. I want to sow my seed and eat my bread. Now, what does it mean, eat my bread? It means God gives me things to enjoy for myself. How am I going to be a blessing to others if I'm not renewed? God may give a house or an apartment or a car, time, space. If you're constantly inundated with ministry and people and things, you're going to burn out. You're not going to last long. If you have no boundaries in your life, then you don't understand the difference between seed and bread. There are boundaries in my life. I know that there is bread for the house. There is bread for my house. There's bread for me that I have to eat. Why? Because I'm not just a spirit. I'm a human. I have to understand the difference between the divinity in me, the Christ in me, and the humanity in me. Jesus was hungry. He had to eat sometimes. He had to drink water. He had to sit down. If he just kept on ministering and ministering and ministering and ministering, he would have collapsed after a few months. And so you have to distinguish what amount of money is bread and what amount of money is seed. Now, I pray about this all the time. I don't assume I'm just giving God my tithe. I don't assume I'm just giving God what I've already pledged for the vision fund. As I shared with you a few months ago, I preached in a church, uh, and they gave me, uh, I didn't even know I was getting an offering. They would do me a favor by uh, doing a video for me, professional video, and uh, they want to have given me an incredible offering. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I got all the things I need for material ministries. I have to put up a new website. I need uh, video equipment. I have this and that. And that's mad. I got it, man. The beginning of the year, I got it. And then God said to my wife, sold the whole amount. I said, what? That was bread, not seed. And I argued with her for a few days. And then finally I said, you know what, I better pray. And I prayed and God said, it's seed, not bread. I had to sow the whole amount. It was a lot of money. And you know what? One of the signs I knew it was God, because when I gave that money, I was so filled with joy. I had never in my 30, I'm almost saying 40 years, in my 39 years of being a Christian, I never felt such joy in writing that check and putting it into Resurrection Church. When you eat your seed, you're not filled with joy. When you eat your bread, you are. Not when you eat your seed. I'm going to tell you something in the spirit. Some of you are robbing God. Some of you are robbing others. And some of you are robbing yourself. Because you're eating your seed. What does that mean? That means that what was supposed to multiply, when you give your time to somebody, man, you might change their life, and they may change their spouse, and they may change their family, and they may change their workplace, they may change their community, just with that little bit of time, that little, right. even a hug sometimes, oh. giving a word, uh, just doing a favor, doing something. Sowing that time can result in a harvest of people coming to know Christ or people being encouraged to do the things that God wants them to do. Sowing that ability, sowing your uh, uh, prayers, sowing your finances, whatever it is, the multiplication factor works no matter what the context. Some produce 30, some 60, some 100 times. 
there is a multiplication in, a, in agrarian culture. You put a seed in, you're going to have a whole lot of plants, right? God says it works the same way in the kingdom, in the spiritual realm. It's not just in the natural. The natural world is actually formed after the spiritual world. It's just depicting what is happening in the spirit. When we sow our love, it multiplies. You may not even see it all. We sow our time, our care, our concern. Jesus said if you just give a cup of cold water to somebody, you will get a reward. Just a cup of cold water. Why? That cup of cold water might have changed someone's life. Sometimes God tells me to say certain things to people that I'll never see again the rest of my life. And I'm not even talking about just preaching. Sometimes I will preach. Sometimes I'll share the gospel. Sometimes I'll just be real nice to somebody. Sometimes I'll just say a real kind thing or tell them what a good job they're doing or give them an extra tip. How do I know that that extra tip stopped them from committing suicide? Maybe it was a sign from God that their life is valuable, that someone appreciates them. You never know what little thing that you do. It's not just saying the gospel, it's living the gospel. Sowing your life. And I know that if you would catch this message today, you go from spending to being spent. If you go from sowing a seed to becoming the seed. If you take heed to what God is saying today, you will multiply such great righteousness. A great harvest will come beyond anything you could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, the fruit that you will bear, you will never find out about until you get to eternity. Because there's going to be so much. Can you imagine asking a farmer, how many plants, how many crops came from this one seed that you sow? You wouldn't be able to tell. Impossible. In heaven, you're going to be shocked. Strangers, people you don't even remember, that you spoke a word to in an airport, sat on a bus next to it, a train. People said, you don't know what you did, you changed my life. With that little bit of goodness, that little bit of love, that handshake, that appreciation changed me. I was over the edge. I was about to end it all. But what you did stopped me. And now I have a beautiful family. He who supplies seed to the sower. If you're lacking seed, that means you're not a sower. <clears throat> or if it's just a small amount, he says... If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. I believe God is changing the culture of our church. From just sowing seed to being the seed. He says you'll be enriched in every way so that we can be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And then he says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. He says there that the contribution they made was an expression of that came out of their confession of the gospel. Confessing the gospel is not just words. It's deeds. It's action. And it's finances. In this particular context, their confession of the gospel is connected to sowing a seed to help poor brothers and sisters in other churches. How many want their confession of the gospel to be more than words? A confession, the word confession means to agree with. When we speak something but we don't have corresponding actions that back it up, 
we're not confessing the gospel. Our actions have to correspond with our confession. Let's pray.